The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. This is the best of Vince Russo's The Brand. To get these programs in their entirety, audio and video, visit us at VinceRussoBrand.com for more information. And now, here's Vince. All right, we are back with our VIP section of this video interview now with the handsome Coney. Look, soap opera star, look at him, bro. He looks as good as he did when he was 22-year-old kid. Look at him. <laughs> 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 Way too kind. Hey, hey, listen, Cody, so you yeah. don't feel lonely. Listen, I got my hookah, my hookah cigarette here. Some Asian guy sold me this hookah. You know, Cody, do you know anything about hookah? Yeah, 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 yeah. I smoke it all the time. I what's have one the, right here. What's, what, you got the pipe and the whole gimmick. Yeah. Is that a hookah that. or is that a car bomb? No, this is a, a vape, vape, vape pen or same shit. Now, <laughs> is, is the whole point of, vo of, of hookah just the flavor? Yeah. Is yeah, that it? Because, yeah. bro, I swear, I think this stuff calms me down. And my 19-year-old oh, no, daughter... Oh, no, no, it does. It does calm you down. Oh, without a doubt, it does Okay, calm see, because my daughter's telling me I'm crazy that hookah doesn't do that to you. Oh, no, no. She, well, she obviously doesn't know. Does she smoke? No. Then she's out of line. So it does calm you down. It does. Definitely. Okay, good. I need Definitely. to know that. Oh, yeah. Now, Conan... Na so does this. What, I, what, what is that now? Cannabis. Oh, my... <laughs> Hey, you know, I got to tell you something, bro. Between you and Jim Mitchell on this show in back-to-back -back weeks, I'm going to be out of business midweek. You know what I'm saying? Brother, let me tell you, <clears throat> you need to go to, uh, to a doctor, right? Right. Oh, it's free. You no, don't I don't got to know there's no doctor here, bro. Right. I, wa I walk right in the store. Brother, just fucking buy a brownie if you don't want to smoke it. Buy a brownie. And don't eat too much of it because it's strong, and you will be relaxed, brother. Listen, you will be got, mellow. Listen, let's You'll, talk about let's yeah. talk about this first since we're talking yeah. about this, okay? Because I want to explain something to you because I need your help here. And bro, this is a shoot. I'm not even kidding around. Right. I'm very stressed out. I'm very high strung. I got high blood pressure. I'm always going crazy. All right. right. Now, now, Conan, when I was in college, right? Yeah. I smoked the ganji because it would put me to sleep. Like, right. as soon as I smoked it, I'd right. be asleep, I'd be relaxed, I'd go to sleep. It was great, right? right. Exactly. Now, what happened was, when I graduated college, I was a little stressed out, you know, trying to find a full-time job. I got married very young, the whole nine yards, right? Yes. So, I was really stressed out of my mind the last two times I did it, right? Right. So, when I did it the last two times, bro, I started freaking out. Like, I felt like my head was on fire, and I felt paranoid, and I felt, like, scared to death. It was a totally horrible experience for me. Right. So, since then, I haven't done it again. Right. So, now I'm in Colorado. I can go to any street corner, get, get whatever I want. I know I need to calm myself down. I need to relax. I'm right afraid it's going to have the same effect on me as it did you know the last two times okay well i would like to think that maybe and i could be wrong that whatever you were given could have been laced with something or it could have been something really really strong and so like when you go to the medicinal place tell them listen i just some i just want something to relax you know and uh, nothing that's so hard on my system and brother they'll find you something that'll relax you you will bro be you want an Conan, Super chili max you want to know something Chil style yeah. listen to this chili max yeah it's the you know what you just said bro one of those two times right yeah. i was in new york city with the guy that i worked for he was a little older than me right right he was he was a jew from new york right right bro it was nighttime and we went into a park and he bought the stuff off of some stranger in a park. We didn't right. even know who the guy was. So that's what you think happened. Could have been, could have been, because that's not a normal reaction. Or they could have given you something really, really strong. There's some strong shit out there that can make you go a little psychotic. So you just want to tell them, I want, you, know, brother, you know what's good? Have you ever tried Xanax? Uh, see, bro, can I tell you something, Conan? Honestly? Yeah. Bro, everything I saw in the wrestling business and right. the boys getting right. addicted to that scares yeah. the hell out of me to yeah. even take an aspirin, bro. 
Right. I, I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, cause is, I never, is, is cause there, I never, cause I never took pills until I got into the business, which is incredible. Is, is actually, there, is there a word for like a very mild, you know, you know, yeah, Gonje. Just, yeah, just tell them, no, we'll just go in and just tell them I want something really mild, something to relax. You know what I'm saying? And okay. they'll give you the right thing, brother. They, there's so many strains of shit now and there's edibles. They have them in juices. That's fucking incredible, bro. Man. They got it over here in gummy worms, bro. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's ridiculous. Okay, let's get back to the rest of it. Now I know what I got to do. So, 1990. I think you will try it. I, bro, so I got it, I think soon, bro. Maybe this weekend. Please tell me how it goes. Yeah, I will. Conan, listen to me. You know how grateful I am that you're having me on this show, that you coming on this show for me, bro? bro yeah, you came on that- my show. What about I came on your show, you come on my show. What about I get the stuff and I try it on your show live? Oh my god. <laughs> Ray, that's rating. Bro, I'm always that's thinking ratings, much. bro. Uh, I wouldn't do it for ratings. I would do it just to hear the joy in your voice and go, you know what? I'm serious, Vince. I would love to just hear say, man, I feel really good and I'm calmed down. Like I am right now. I'm I'm high off you. my fucking ass. Yeah. But it, it'll and you know what? And another thing. You write really good. You know, a lot of people wrote beautiful melodies and music and the Beatles, fucking, the Beatles, bro. Right. And so, like when I'm writing, when when I'm high, I, brother, I just get more creative. It's almost like there's a part of your subconscious that you can reach that you that that. Hey, I want to experience that, bro. Yeah, yeah. Now, Cody, let me ask you this: When you went to WCW and you had the Lucha Libre background going into WCW. Why didn't you ever recommend that somebody put Glenn Gilbinetti under a mask? <laughs> that is true. Well, <laughs> you know what? I, I only took care of the Mexican guys, and I thought with that nose, there wouldn't be a mask big enough that would conceal that fucking toucan Sam beak. <laughs> okay, so, Kona, you come the first time to WCW in around 1990, correct? Right. And, and you're working for Bischoff at that point, correct? No, no. Bischoff wasn't there yet. In 1990, okay. 1990 yes. was, uh, they had just fired um, Ole Anderson. Okay. Anderson was a guy that actually hired me. And uh, he was too much, brother. Even on the phone, like, why do you want to work for WCW? <laughs> and, you know, I was, I was maybe at that time. So if this was 1990, 74, 84, I was like 26 years old, I think, 27, something like that. And he's like, why do you want to work for WCW? And I was like, and, you know, I was like, this was actually what I told him. I said, because I think you guys are better wrestlers, you know, and the WWF to me is a bunch of bullshit show. He goes, don't give me that shit. Why do you really want to be here? Is it for the pussy? Is it for the money? <laughs> Tell me, what the fuck do you want to be doing down here? And I was like, I just told the motherfucker, you know, I, I act, that's actually why I wanted to be there because I liked wrestling. And, uh, and then he hired me. And then when I got there, he was fired. And uh, Jim, uh, Jim Ross was still working there. And he told me, he said, we're going to do something with uh, you and Brian Pillman. Uh, but uh, that was the first time I was there. But, but you weren't there for a long time. What, what, what happened after that? Because uh, um, after that, that was 89. Because from there, you went to the WWE with the Max Moon gimmick. Right, 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 right. What happened was, is I now remember, now I remember. What happened was, is that um, they were going to get a new book, and it could have been Ric Flair, I think. And while I was waiting for them, you know, while I was waiting for them to be a booker, Pat Patterson had found out about me through this mm-hmm. guy called Red Bastine. Yep. Who used From to From California. Like, right, right. Yeah, and I yeah. started in San Diego, you know, yeah. Tijuana. So Red Bastine would always take me with him to, um, uh, you know, like fucking Northern California and all these other places so I could gain experience. And he must have told Pat Patterson about me because Pat was calling me and calling me. And then he was like... Uh, he just said, fuck it, you know, what, it isn't going to hurt you to come and talk to us. And so, you know, they, I'd never been in a limo. They picked me up in a limo. I got hired the same day uh, Percy Pringle got hired. And, uh, you know, we both went there and Vince was very cool with me, you know, and um, that's what happened. You know, Vince met me the very, very first day I went there and he showed an interest in me. So I just, you know, signed with them. Now, Conan, 
the Max Moon gimmick, from what I understand, that right. was that was all your baby. Is that correct? Right. Correct. Now, bro, yes. the, the, I, here's what I want to point out, bro. This is 1992. Right. I mean, you, you were years ahead of your time with that gimmick. Yeah. What do, do you think that that might have been part of the reason why why the gimmick didn't reach the potential because it was so outside of the realm of what a character should have been at that point in 1992? Uh, there's a little bit to that, but I also think that the the costume originally, what it was going to do was going to, out of this one tube under the arm, it was going to shoot confetti. Uh, out of the other one, I think fire was going to come out. And I also had this idea to do a jet pack from the, from the uh, you know, entrance the into to the, the ring. ring. Oh, yeah. wow. And Vince was like, you can't do that in an indoor building. And so I was thinking of other ways that, you know, I was always just thinking. But what happened was is that when uh, it was a pain in the ass to go to WWE all the time because I would come from Mexico. I had to go to L.A. and pick up the robot. And the robot was like about eight fucking boxes, brother. And I had to put it in the taxi and, you know, oh, and thanks. then fly it over there. Yeah. And in Mexico, I was blowing up big. I had just done a soap opera and I was just blowing up big. And I was like, fuck WWE. And so I never really went back to finish the, the whole character. You know what I'm saying? There was other stuff that was still coming. And Vince, Vince did, did uh, you know, he invested a lot of money in that. It was $13,000. Yeah, and yeah. He, he was very hands-on with me. I think it's something that he saw for merchandising. And, 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 and it was something so different than everything else. But I just never came back to work. That's the truth. Do you, do you ever regret not seeing that through? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I do. I do. I've never really even. Yeah, I really kind of do. Yeah. Now, now, Conan, was there a was there a um was there a blow up between you and Vince at any point, or did you just not go back? Yeah, I just never went back. So you never had a face to face encounter with him from from that time. Was that the last time you ever did business with him? No, when when I when I would see him, you know, he was like very hands on with my gimmick, right? Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, uh, so I saw him a lot, actually, you know, and um, but I just didn't I wasn't mature enough or I didn't give the courtesy. At the end of the day, I don't think I gave a fuck. I was yeah. just like, fuck it. I'm the man. I mean, I am the man right here in Mexico. What do I would I need the United States for? And so it, it was like, whatever, brother, I'm not there. So obviously, yeah, whatever you want to do. And maybe Vince was probably like, fuck, look at this motherfucker. I gave him $13,000 to do this gimmick, and he didn't even have the balls to say bye or some shit. And if he thought that, he's right, you know? Now, wh wh where does the heat with Pritchard come in with you? I don't know, brother. I don't know. I really don't know. That's why I would like for you to tell me, because he was always a dick every time I went to WWE, like a real big dick. And when I was, when I was in WWE, he was brother love. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told me it was like from Houston or some shit like that. And he was telling me stuff about like r luchadors and, uh, you know, like Mexican famous, famous wrestlers and shit. And we got along fine. So I don't know if somebody, I don't know, brother. Uh, you know what I think it was, Conan? Because, yeah. uh, bro, I tell you, even when I got there, and I, yeah. I probably got there in about like 95, okay? Right. Bro, your name still used to come up. And right. every time your name used to come up, it, it used to be Pritchard that used to poo-poo it. But right. now that you tell me that story, there's no doubt in my mind that Pritchard was poo-pooing it because basically, you know, he knew that Vince would poo-poo it because of past history. And, you know, you know, bro, a lot of the times Pritchard just went along with Vince. So, like, right. I, I don't think it was ever anything personal. Okay. So so now 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 you go back to in '96. Now you go back to WCW. Now you bring all the luchadors over with you. Now now the luchas really take off in the United States for the first time. Conan, I'm I'm going to ask you this question now because I want to know the answer to this because everything I'm reading. You know, you brought these guys over. I mean, that's that's the research that I did, but. 
I've heard I've heard Eric in many into in many interviews say that he was basically responsible for you know WCW going in that direction in '96 and '97 with the with the Luchas. So I, I just want to clarify this now: was it was it your idea and he green lighted it, or did he actually come up with the idea and tell you to bring all these guys in? No, basically, uh, Kevin Sullivan was the one that probably I would give credit to. He was the one that I was in ECW at the time, and, and he called me and he said, hey, you know, come over. We might, want, we might do something with you and Hogan in Mexico. And so I told Polly, you know, yo, I'm going to dip, but, uh, you know, and I'm probably going to take Rey Mysterio with me in psychosis, but I'll give you other guys. And, like, I gave him Hoove and Toot and Park. I didn't want to leave him high yeah. and dry because Polly was very good to me. And so um, uh, when I, the first thing I did when I got there, because um, Kevin really took care of me and he, he, you know, I could tell he had plans with me. I told him, brother, you got to bring in Ray Mysterio and Psychosis. And he goes, who are they? And then I told him, I showed him, and then he went to Bischoff. And so, of course, you brother, you know, you, you, know, I, I, you know, these guys have never seen wrestling like that in their life. So, of course... They had to say yes because it was just incredible. Conan, I'm glad you told that story because I've never he heard Kevin Sullivan's name involved in that before. And I'm right. glad that you brought that up if he was instrumental in bringing the guys over. Yeah, definitely. Hey, Conan, I want to take a step backwards before I go forward because I, I did miss it here, but you brought it up. You worked at ECW for, for a short stint. Right. What are your feelings with your experiences You know, on, on, on Paul Heyman? Uh, Paul Lee, great guy, man. You know, we, uh, uh, he, he was actually in WCW the very first time I went there in, um, in 90. 90. Yeah, yeah. He was like, he was a commentator. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 And so, uh, we got along there. Then I saw him in a trip in Singapore and that's when he told me, he says, I'm going to start this group. I'm going to be working for this group called ECW and I want to bring in Love Machine and Eddie Guerrero. How good are those guys? And I go, bro, they're the best. And uh, how about Ray Mysterio and Psychosis? I go, there's nobody that can wrestle like them in the world because I'm going to call you when I start, you know? So we always had a good friendship. One, uh, we kind of had like a little strain our relationship because when I went to WCW, pa do you remember Pedro Morales? Sure, of course I do. Yeah, Pedro Morales was my manager, bro. Well, I didn't know that. How awesome is that? That's awesome, bro. I'm ready for any type of action. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> that guy right there. Yeah. So, uh, and you know, he was always telling me, because I was very wild, man, when I got in, you know, I was very young and wild, and he was, calm down, you know, he would always say, calm down, take it easy, you know, take it easy, you know, you don't want to eat the world in, in one bite in one day, you know, you want to calm down, because I was very high strung. And uh, so anyways, one day I was on stage in Philadelphia and I said something about, you know, ECW being like in a bingo hall and it got back to Pali and he didn't talk to me for like a couple of years, bro. Wow. Wow. Yeah, very, it was a very sensitive issue with him. Have you spoken to him since? I, the last time, <laughs> that motherfucker, the last, <laughs> <laughs> the last time I spoke to him was like maybe two years ago when uh, Brock Lesnar was going to fight. I forgot who. And he promised me he would get me some tickets. And then the day of the show, I called him and he goes, man, Dana is giving those tickets to some guys from Congress. And I go, fuck. You know, and that was like the last time we actually talked. Oh, jeez. But you he's know, a trip. Do you get along with him? You know, bro, I never really got the chance to work with him. You know, we, we've had conversations here and there. I never got the chance to work with him. The thing about Paul Heyman, bro, just, you know, you know, just studying him and watching him, and maybe you could put some insight into this, bro, the way he motivated those guys, I, I think was unfreaking believable. My appeal to ECW Conan was, and this is a shoot, I'd watch that show thinking that, okay, I'm going to watch somebody break their neck this week or break their back. The way he motivated them to work the way they did. Bro, to this day, I don't know how the guy did it. H how did he do it? I mean, what was there about him that the I guys... That, I think that he got a lot of guys that weren't given a break in the wrestling industry. And they were all hard workers and passionate. And he knew how to raise their self-esteem. 
and make them work as a unit and say, we're the underdogs, fuck the other guys. And he got that message across, bro. And he brought in another fan base and he revolutionized wrestling. Yeah. Brother, wrestling, when I watched his show, I didn't think anybody's going to actually break their neck, but I knew that that show was going to be exciting. And it was either the music or the girl kissing the other girl or fucking Raven stuff or fucking New Jack. Whatever it was, he always, he just did a masterful job of keeping you interested. And, you know, and Joey in post-production, you know, what he brought yeah, to it. And yeah. it was just a great show, brother. You, you have to give the motherfucker his props. Oh, there's no doubt about that. Now, Conan, I got to give you your props because, you know, you, you don't realize it, bro. When you brought all these luches over, you know, yeah. bro, do you, do you realize that was almost 20 years ago? I, yeah. I, I, bro, I love the, I love the, you know, the, the, the what, what's the word you use when you could see into the future? I mean, like, bro, it, it yeah. you, you had that knack of always kind of knowing what that next wave was. Let me ask you this, Conan, when yeah. all the luchas came into WCW and right. it was, bro, it was red hot. Nobody had ever seen anything like it before. This is 96, 97. If you were booking here in the States and you had all those guys come over here for the first time with your booking experience, would you have done it? anything different well yeah it wouldn't have made them all jobbers you know what i'm saying and yeah. that's basically what they did with the exception of maybe ray and me uh maybe a little bit hooventude everybody else is just like a jobber and that's how they got treated you know and they had just incredible talent and they could have done things differently but i just don't think you know even like uh I don't think you probably understood them when they came over either, you know, when you first saw them. Nobody did. And they didn't know what to do with them. What do we do with these guys? They're too small, but they're Mexican, but they're good. But fuck, if we put them in the main events, how the fuck are we going to ever, you know what I'm saying? And we can't go after them because we can't follow them. So they just held everybody back. And some of it was just ignorance. Some of it cultural. They're not Latinos, so they don't know how to appeal to Latinos. And... Um, and, and, you know, in a way, I can't blame them because it was so new. But, you know, I think also in their mind, they were like, these guys are too small and they're ethnic. There's no way we're going to put them on top. Yeah, you know, Conan, you know what? You know what I used to, I used to, the, the problem I used to be faced with, th bro, these guys were no doubt the greatest workers in the world. But, like, I kind of knew, bro, when you saw them like every, you know, week after week after week after week, there was going to come a time when the work, you know, wasn't so special anymore because they had seen it so much. And, you know, as a booker, my challenge always was, okay, now, now they've seen the work. Now it's nothing new. Now they almost expect it. So there came a point with me where now you have to start telling stories with these guys just like everybody else and bro the problem i ran into was the the communication gap because it was twofold for me bro first of all you know they wore the mask and you know conan that takes away all the emotion of the face so if they had to get something over or tell a story, you could never see it in their face. That's number one. And then number two, when you had the communication barrier and, you know, they, they broke, they, they spoke broken English and they weren't easy to understand. Once it got to that level, I, I, at that point, I found it very difficult to figure out how to get these guys over to the next level. Was I missing something, bro? Is there something I could have done differently? I don't know to this day. No, the thing is, is that like, for example, when you bring up the thing about the mask that, you know, emotion is so important and, and you know, if they have the mask on, what are they emoting? But it's just kind of funny because when you're in Mexico and you have to work with the mask, mm -hmm. they get their emotions over. So, you probably think that because you've never how, had to work how, with somebody with how a mask. How, how do they do that, Conan? Explain that to me. With their hands. Wow, you know? okay. 
That's it with their hand. Where did you get hit? You know, you know, cover up right there. Limp your body. You know, you just sell with your body instead of with your face. And so when you, when you haven't been confronted with that approach, yeah, you would think, how the fuck are they going to show an emotion if they don't show their face? But I work with them in, in you know what I'm saying? So oh, I've God, seen bro, it. it can uh, be yeah, uh, bro, I, I'm sitting here now saying, I wish somebody would have told me 15 years ago what you just told me now. That's yeah. the first time I've ever heard that. And that's very, very interesting to me, bro. And I, I can I can certainly understand that. Yeah. Bro, let's talk about your years in the NWO. Because right. I, I got to tell you something, Conan, and this is an absolute shoot. Keep in mind, when Hogan came out and joined Bischoff, I, I mean, and joined, I'm sorry, Hall and Nash, right? Right. Bro, I was at Pritchard's house. I was like the last man on the totem pole, you know, in the create on the creative team at that point. I was just brought in by Bill Watts. Bill Watts was let go. So now I'm sitting there with Pritchett and Cornette and like, I'm just keeping my mouth shut. I'm not saying a word. I was at Pritchard's house with the Hogan thing, bro. And bro, I remember sitting on Pritchett's couch and thinking we are absolutely dead. It's over. It's finished. They are going to kick the ever-loving you-know-what out of us. I knew immediately. Bro, being there and being in that building and working through that time, what, was that a time you experienced in the wrestling business perhaps like no other where, you know, like everything happened so big and so fast that it was almost difficult to keep up with? Yeah, I ran into that in Mexico before I ran into it in the United States. I actually ran into it like when uh, Vampiro and myself were on top in Mexico. At that time, wrestling was just, you have no idea how enormous it was in that country. And But yeah, but to be there when the NWA, NWO exploded was just incredible. They were like rock stars, you know, and uh, it was just incredible. Do you think, bro, that the mistake was made to let it linger on and go on too long until it meant nothing? I think more than that when they put in too many people into it, and I could have been one of them, but uh, they just had too many people in the NWO, so it wasn't elite anymore, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, let me ask you this, Conan. You know, you're a booker, right? And right. Be being that that was so red hot, right? Right. What would you, as a booker, what do you think you could have done differently to sustain that for a longer period of time? Do you think there's anything you could have done? I don't remember too much what was going on back in that period, to tell you the truth. Because, um, uh, brother, you know this as well as I do. You know, everything just goes by so fast sometimes. Yep. And... Yep. Um, you know, sometimes I have to watch matches and I forget I was in them and I don't have concussion effects or anything like that that I know of. But just we work so, you know, you know what I'm saying? You, yeah, uh, yeah. Fuck, like one day, next thing you know, it's six days later. And um, so bro, I, I just don't, think, bro. you know, you know, one of the things that I think that Eric should have done, because this is one of the things that really led to a lot of the breakup behind the scenes in my eyes was... Ho Hall and Nash went after Hogan, all right? And I think Eric had to choose between Hall and Nash or Hogan, and he went with Hogan. And that was a war behind the scenes that really affected everybody. I think if Bischoff would have been smarter, he would have had Hogan, Nash, and, you know, uh, Scott Hall work together. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because they yeah. were so busy tearing each other apart behind the scenes and doing things that were counterproductive. And then, it, you know... And that had a lot to do with it too. Now, 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 Conan, you left. You left WCW. Um, you know, again, Ed Ferrara and myself came in right. at that point. You know, once the NWO thing died off and Bischoff was gone, here come me and Ferrara. I got to tell you, Conan, my first time, my first day on the job, 
I will never forget how crystal clear it was that the locker room was so split and so divided. It was absolutely ridiculous. I remember the first time ever making eye contact with Hulk Hogan and just the look in his eye when when we looked at each other. I mean, bro, this guy didn't trust me as far as he could throw me. We came in with a game plan, bro, because keep in mind, I had been watching the product leading up to me coming in, and all I could see was this great young talent stuck on that second-tier level. Bro, I remember the week before Ed and I came in, Hogan and, and Flair had a match, and bro, with all due respect, I, I felt embarrassed for them. Right? right. So I knew we had to come in and, you know, take the Hogan's and take the flares, package them and put them in the right situation so they could still be stars. But it was imminent that we had to bring these talented guys up to the next level, you know, in order for WCW to succeed. Now, bro, you got to know, you got to understand me coming in with that psychology. I know there's a bullseye on my back. You know, I, I, I know Hogan's burying me. I know Ric Flair is running to Bill Bush. Bro, I know what's going on. But at the end of the day, when I'm looking at, you know, guys like you and guys like Ray and Eddie and Benoit and Malenko and all those guys, Jericho, you know, well, Jericho had gone by then, but it was the right thing to do. So like, I even knew, listen, if this is going to cost me my job, this is the right thing for WCW. Conan, with that type of psychology, is there any way I could have went about it? Is there something I could have done differently to make that vision come to fruition other than be gone in three months? You know what, brother? You know, and not only that, you also had on your back the bullseye from all of Bischoff's boys. You know, right. so all the people that felt they were loyal to him because he got him jobs. But I think maybe you came in too aggressive and, 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 and this has happened to me before. And, you know, I'm glad I finally learned this later than never, but brother, you just gotta be, you just gotta go in there sometimes and you just gotta be a peacemaker. And, you know, maybe if you would have explained everything, you know, calmly to Bischoff and to Hogan and to everybody that has power there and got them on your side. And you know what I'm saying? I just felt, they felt all right. Well, f you know, fuck Vince. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Does yeah, that make yeah, sense? Yeah, no, it makes all the sense in the world. But uh, unfortunately, bro, that's just not in my makeup. Yeah. You know, and I mean, yeah, bro, I, I, I probably could have come in there and handled it differently. But, you know, history is history. But also, bro, around the time I left now, you kind of had a little bit of a falling out with Bill Bush. I think you had asked him for his, for your release. And then did he wind up suspending you or something? Exactly how did it go down? Because I wasn't there, bro. I don't know what happened. No, what happened was is that uh, um, basically Eric Bischoff had a meeting and he was, he was kind of calling motherfuckers out that were that were fucking just being rowdy and shit and he told raven he said yeah raven i hear you're talking all this bullshit and uh he goes if you want to he goes there's a lawyer right there and you can quit and raven goes all right where's the lawyer <laughs> and he got up and he went and he fucking signed it and then he goes hey, now next you know conan you're getting on the mic and you're saying bad words and all this other bullshit and then i said uh i said well dennis rodman said bad words too and he was like, I don't give a, I, I expect as much from him, you know, um, uh, you know, you know better than that. And if you don't want to do things my way, he goes, there's a lawyer right there too. And then I said, well, are you going to let Ray Mysterio go? He goes, no. He goes, well, do you still want to stay? He goes, well, not if you're going to, and this is in front of all the boys, not if you're not going to let Ray go. He goes, well, if you stay, I'm going to make life miserable for you. And he did. And, uh, and so, you know, that's the wrap with that. How did he make life miserable for you? I'm just curious. Just basically um, not featuring me anymore, you know, putting me in, uh, 
I, you know, taking me out of storyline. Um, he one time had told me and um, uh, um, what's this guy's name? Billy Kidman, because mm-hmm. we were comp- uh, we were uh, we were complaining about something, and he actually told us this in uh, in um, where the Islanders play. What's that place called? A uh, Coliseum, Nassau Coliseum. Nassau Coliseum, and he had actually told us that uh, he actually. Um, was about to or was going to, I don't remember exactly how he said it, he was going to get some guys to um, come into the dressing room and uh, put like, you know, turn off the lights and beat us up. I'm serious. And uh, I was like, brother... Conan, I, I got it. I wish you would have done that. I, I wish you would have done that. I got to ask you a question along those terms. Now, bro, yeah. may, maybe, bro, like I was just so naive and so oblivious. Bro, I we went through your history early on. And right. I mean, Conan, you're a legitimate badass. And bro, I'm not just saying, you know, growing up on the street and, you know, selling drugs to gangs at 13 years old. But bro, from there, you were a, you know, you were a world-class boxer. I mean, you were a bodybuilder. You're a legitimate badass. Bro, maybe I'm being naive and maybe I wasn't in those situations enough. But I got to tell you, bro, all the years that I've known known you i've never seen you threaten anybody or bully anybody or do any physical damage to anybody when obviously you could have now did i just not see that side of conan or did you just not conduct yourself that way because again conan with your background in Mexican and being a part of the office and being the booker and being on that side of it, did that help you maintain more of a level head than perhaps just being one of the boys would have gave you? Yeah, yeah, no, that definitely helped. I think that, um, you know, my main thing, bro, is I would never want to get violent in the workplace or anything like that because I know that um, it would it would just get worse and um, it wouldn't end there. So I, I and on top of that, um, you know, I never ever want to go back to jail for any reason. You know what I'm saying? Did you ever lose your temper, bro? Where it almost got bad? Oh yeah, one of the time was the time that uh, um, one of the the time I came the closest was uh, remember that time that uh, I don't think you were in the promotion yet that um. Eric Bischoff threw coffee on Eddie Guerrero. No, no, I don't know about that. Yeah, well, him and Eddie were arguing. And, uh, you know, Eddie's like Ray. You know, there's just, there's a special bond between us three. Yeah. And, um, and so, uh, you know, he came out and it was in El Paso, Texas, which is where Eddie's from. Yeah. And um, so he threw some coffee on him and, and Eddie came out and he was real pissed off. And he was like, man, it was fuck fucking Eric Bischoff threw coffee on me. I go, what? He goes, yeah. And I go, man, just tell me and I'll make that call. And brother, I was going to have people come over and just beat the fuck out of him. And Eddie was like, don't do that. You know, he goes, God, God, God will take care of him because he was very religious, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it came very, very close to him getting his ass like severely handed to him. Now, did you ever like show up at the building like and see Glenn Gilbernetti and like just want to hit him? Oh, definitely. <laughs> Just donkey punches, bitch ass. <laughs> now, Conan, I want to I want to turn to TNA because yeah. again, bro, Conan, I don't think you. He, that's the word I was looking for before. Visionary. Yeah, bro, I don't think you get the credit for being the visionary that you are. And I mean, bro, I've already laid out three or four examples of right. of you being ahead of your time and yeah. and seeing things that were were ten years ahead of its time. Bro, right. you know, I, I know you came to TNA and I know for a while, you know, you did the three live crew with, right. with Ron and, and BG. I know you did all that, but bro, right. there was a time at TNA where I went home for a while. You know, I, I, I had become a Christian and I just, I needed to get away from the wrestling business. Right. And, and when I went home and the times that I did watch the television, bro, Bro, the only thing that caught my eye was this LAX. 
Right. Again, another brainchild of Conan that, bro, I'm, I, it wasn't only the hottest thing on the show. It was the only thing on the show. And I, I got to tell you, Conan, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah. I worked a lot of years with Hernandez and Homicide. A lot of years. And, bro, where, where they had their talent, okay, bro, they were both green in a lot of areas. I mean, a lot of areas. They had a raw talent, but they were green. But here you were, bro. You took these two guys that were still green. Bro, you had the only thing on the show that mattered. Now, I wasn't there when LAX started. Because you were able to get it so over, and bro, listen, I know you're working with Jeff now, but I'm not talking about now. I'm talking about then. Right. Be being that you were able to get that so over, was that concept embraced or was it kind of, you know, kept in the background because maybe it wasn't somebody else's idea? No, I'll tell you the, and let me tell you about Homicide and and uh, Hernandez. I did handpick both of them, but the thing was is that um, even though they were green, there was a rawness about them. There was a rawness yeah. about the way you know, because yeah. when you talk to D, the Homicide, you know, how he talks. That's how he talks. Yeah, you know, he's from Brooklyn. He's from the streets. You know, and nobody else sounds like that on 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 TV. You know, so I was like, wow, there's a Puerto Rican who was a legitimate Latin king, you know what I'm saying, Boricua, you know, and we got this big old good-looking power bull house fucking Hernandez, you know. Nobody looked like that in wrestling, and we're all three Latinos, and our whole thing was like, if you ain't Latin, you ain't shit. That's really what LAX was about, and uh, so when I brought it to them, one of the main reasons that they actually accepted it was because when they broke up 3L, 3LK, which was me and uh, Road Dog and Ron Killings, I had asked them to put me and Ron Killings together, and they wouldn't. I'm not even going to say they. It was Jeff. Jeff wouldn't. Ron Killings told them, can I team up with Jeff Hardy? Because him and Hardy are real good friends. And he says, no, you can't. And I was like, fuck, man. What, why are they fucking with Ronnie so much? And so I got really legitimately angry. And I just started politicking and going, this is bullshit. You know, if you're not going to work me and Ronnie together, well, at least work us separately, but work us. Do you know when I just kept on him and on him and then I brought him the idea, you know, of LAX and Dutch loved it, bro. That's what happened. Dutch loved it and he convinced Jeff. And I got to give props to Dutch. Oh, Yosemite Sam himself. No, bro, give him props. Because yeah. like I said, bro, when I was sitting at home and watching, that was the only thing that, that would stop me to watch the television set. Yeah. I mean, and again, bro, just so ahead of its time. I mean, and, you know, and, you know, and you know what was cool, too? And I actually love this a lot. If you remember at the beginning of the L.A., because when we came out, if you remember, we would come out to like a video. They yep. wouldn't really show. And in the video, it had old scenes of Latin revolutions in Cuba and Bolivia and Nicaragua. And it showed like old school, you know, uh, fucking dictators and shit like that. And it was interchopped with, you know, union workers, you know, Mexican migrant workers with fucking uh, picket signs. And, you know, and it was fucking really well done. The, the intro, I, I liked that a lot. Now, Conan, I do you remember that or no? Oh, yeah, no, I absolutely yeah. do. And and yeah. I remember, I, you know, thankfully, I did have the opportunity to work with LAX because I did come back, you know, to TNA when that was still going on. But but things started souring a little bit, you know, between you and, uh, you know, and, and yeah, I, I, I guess correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it seemed to be mostly Jeff. Right. You know, but again, Conan, I got to say, you know, you, you, you voiced 
your opinion like a respectful human being. You know, you never threaten to beat the crap out of anybody. I right. mean, because I remember I, I used to get a lot of those talks and, right. you know, you used to talk to me about how you were feeling at the time and whatnot. What what exactly did you feel what, what started happening that led to the breakdown between, you know, you and Jeff a, as far as on a creative level? Well, what happened was is that I always get in trouble for this. My big mouth. They had interviewed me and uh, about TNA, and just like I did it when I was in WCW, I just buried the people that needed to be buried, and I just said what I felt like saying. And so I had gone and I had asked them for a raise because I haven't had a raise since I'd been there, I think, or maybe. And so I was due for a raise, and I was like, bro, you know, I mean, I need to get a little mm -hmm. bit of credit for the LAX thing, and uh, you know, we're selling more shirts than everybody and you know, all these motherfuckers are coming in they're getting more money than us and he goes uh well this is exactly probably what started it he goes well he goes if you want to raise you're gonna have to talk to and you probably remember this guy dean broadwater <laughs> broad broadhead <laughs> yeah remember that guy yeah but let's call him broadwater for, for this broadwater <laughs> he's a finance guy right yes yes, okay. yes so anyways and so i go jeff why are you trying to bullshit me if I go to Broadwater, he's going to tell me, you know what? I don't know if I should give you a raise. That's Jeff's decision. Yep, so let's cut yep. out the bullshit. Yep. Tell me if you're going to give me a fucking raise or you're not going to give me a raise. And he goes, I don't think we can at this moment or some shit like that. And uh, so, brother, I, I was fucking hot. And um, uh, like the next day, I think it was, um, I just went up to him and I just told him, I go, brother, I quit. And I just left. Now, now, Conan, shortly after that, you had your hip replacement first, right? Right. Now, now, Conan, how long had you been suffering with that, with, with the hip, your hip condition? A long time, man. Bro, that's A got, long and, that, time. and bro, I've never had that, but I can only imagine. Bro, that's got to be painful as hell. You know why I say that, bro? You'll appreciate yeah. this. You know the manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates, Clint Hurdle? Of course. Bro, he's getting hip replacement in the offseason. And I don't know if you saw the playoff game against the Giants. They showed him in the dugout a couple of times. Bro, the guy couldn't even freaking walk. I can only imagine because I know you. I know how bullheaded and stubborn you are. You were working with the bum hip. Bro, yeah. what's, what's that type of pain like? And then again, bro, I can only imagine you got to take painkillers to mask right. the pain. Right. How, how does a wrestler, bro, how do you work through something like that? You know, bro, it's just the same thing like you, why How many times you've probably quit and said, I'm never going back, and you came back. It's the love of the game, brother. It's in your system, you know. we 90% of us, I would say that high, once we touch that drug, that poison, it's very hard to leave, man. It's very hard to leave because we've all suffered in this business. All of us have. Mm -hmm. And here we are. We still are. Here we are on a wrestling podcast talking about wrestling. But one of the beautiful things about wrestling to me is, you know, what we all hate is the politics and the yeah. bullshit and all right. that bullshit. But the thing that we all love is that camaraderie that you and me were in the same business or you and me and Disco or you, me and Ed or, you know, and that you can sit down and just tell stories and reminisce and you know what I'm saying? And, yes. and the cool people that you do meet, which is way more than the dicks you meet in this business that, you know, some of the characters that, you know, it's just, it's just very infectious. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, now, Conan, I want to ask you a little bit about this. And, bro, please, please forgive me if I'm being absolutely naive. Right. But, but I want to really know and I want to understand, okay? Right. After you get the hip replacement. Right. Okay. The next thing that happens is the kidney transplant. Right. Right. Now, Conan, I, again, I apologize for being naive. I want to understand. Right. How how does that condition start, and when do you start realizing like you've got a major major issue with your kidney? Well, here's the problem: that uh, kidney when your kidneys are failing, the only way you would know is if you go to the doctor 
and he's taking like a blood, you know, like a general blood test and he checks for everything. Right. And, uh, but I wasn't going to the doctor and there are no signs. It isn't like your, your side hurts or you start bleeding out of the nose. I mean, there are no motherfucking sy- symptoms. The symptoms is when you get your blood drawn and they go, hey, your kidneys are failing. So uh, I had been told once, hey, your blood pressure is high and I'd get your kidneys checked. But I thought, because, you know, when you're on the juice, on the steroids, uh, fucking your blood pressure raises. So I thought my blood pressure might have been raising because of the, you know, steroid usage. And uh, anyways, um, so I was never really paid attention to my kidney. Plus, I was in a ladder match and, I, and it lacerated my kidney when a ladder fell on it. But the way I found out was, is that... Um, uh, I had gone in to get my hip replacement. And when I went in to get my hip replacement, they were like, your kidneys are dying. You need to go on dialysis. I was like, what? And they were like, yeah, you need to go on dialysis, brother. And they stuck a catheter <clears throat> oh. in the fucking vein of my neck, bro. Mm. And with no anesthesia. And later oh. on, I found out they're supposed to do it with anesthesia. I was like, motherfucker. But anyways, uh, and so... I had to come back because I was in Mexico when I w- where I was going to get the kidney operation. So I had to come back to the United States and um, uh, get on dialysis, bro, and then get like uh, uh, a kidney donor because my kidneys were failing. Now, now, it had nothing to do with anything that happened in your years in wrestling, did it? I don't know. It could have been that ladder I told you that lacerated my kidney. That could have been it, but I don't know. But the doctors never really pinpointed anything. Because by the time I went there, my kidney was like, I don't know if it it was all so beat up or dried up or whatever it is. Even doing a biopsy, they wouldn't have been able to tell. But wow. Well, you know... At that you, at that moment, bro. You know, what this is a weird thing, bro. But but Disco used to tell me this about you all the time because yeah, I'm yeah. I'm li- I'm like you when it comes to this. Disco yeah. used to always tell me all the time with you that you never drink water, and Disco blame that on your on your kidney problems. Is that, that true? Is, that is not true. But I will publicly say that Disco would drink golden showers. <laughs> Okay, now Conan, listen. You get so now. You, how, how long do you wait for this kidney donor? It was like six months. It wasn't that long. Most people are waiting years and shit. Now, 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 I, I would believe that the doctors told you once you get this kidney transplant, you're never going to work again, right? Right. And you've worked since, right? Yes. You're not worried about that? No, nah, bro. You you can't, man. You know, I I'm an entertainer at heart. You know, and uh, I just remember even when I was like a little boy and they would bring over family for like Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever. I would always get all my cousins and neighbors and we'd have talent contest. And sh- and I was always like, I liked attention. That's why I got into boxing. Yeah. Cause my, my real father was a boxer. And I guess I wanted to maybe show him that, hey, I followed in your footsteps or whatever. And so... You know, um, and I was flashy when I was in the ring. I was flashy. I was always, you know, dressing up like Hector Camacho. And so I guess there's always been uh, that side of me that likes to entertain people. And that's why I, I, I still do. You know, it's, I don't wrestle right now. I'm just, you know, I just kind of like a manager and shit. But I just like going out there and, and getting heat from the fans as a heel. You know, Conan, let me ask you this again. With your, with your background in booking and running your own company, you've done everything there is to do in the wrestling business, everything. We all know the current state of TNA. You know, will they or will they not have a television contract January 1st? Having been there and having worked there for a long period of time, bro, where, where did that company go wrong in your estimation? Well, it starts, it, was it was it Dean Broadwater? I don't know if it was Dean Broadwater, <laughs> but I will tell you that uh, you know it just starts with Dixie. She doesn't know about wrestling, and when you sit down with her, you figure that out real quick. I mean, yeah, she knows how to work the cameras and be glamorous, and oh, I'm the first female owner of TNA, and they give her softball questions, but she doesn't know what she's doing. You know, there's a lot of nepotism there, a lot of family members that are in fucking you know, that are employees or that they don't know what the fuck they're doing. And, um, and, and it's just, brother, it's just been, 
it's just been frustrating because yeah. I think it just starts with Dixie. To me, it starts with Dixie. And I don't think she's ever really brought in the proper people to run that place. Bro, it begins and ends at the top. I always say that. And listen, I told you, bro, we touched upon this briefly on your show. You know, Je- Jeff's not talking to me anymore. And, you know, I, right. I, don't, I, I don't have any heat at all with Jeff. He's got heat with me. I think I understand where the heat comes from. I think it's a shame, bro, because I, I miss talking to him. I miss having him as a friend. I'm so excited, uh, you know, about this, this, uh, this pay-per-view he's got coming up in Japan in January. Uh, you know, I, I, I wish well, why I was. Do you, why do you think you have heat with him? Ah, uh, bro, I, 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 I know why I have heat with him, bro. Because when they brought me in as a consultant, you know, Dixie wanted it to be this big secret. She basically told me flat out, if you tell anybody, it's it's yeah, you're done. Fired, right. You're fired. It, it's over and it's done with. So, bro. I didn't tell anybody. Nobody knew outside of my family. Right. Well, well, what what happened, bro, is one day, um, one day there was a meeting in the office, and it was Jeff, it was John Gaborik, and it was Dixie, and they had Dixie's mother Janice on the phone, and while while the three of them were sitting there, Janice said to John, "How are things working out with Vince?" That's when Jeff found out I was working in some way, shape, or form with TNA. Since then, bro, he's not spoken to me. I've tried reaching out. I've sent emails. Bro, I would love to just promote what he's doing. You know, I mean, and the reason why I got on this tangent, bro, was there's no question in my mind if Jeff would have never lost power at TNA. And, bro, listen, I had my differences with Jeff just like you did. And, you know, a lot of times, bro, I've known the guy for 20 years. We've had love. We've had hate. We've had it all. But I also do know just from a wrestling knowledge standpoint, I think that company would be in a much different place if Jeff never lost control of that company i will say that because bro i'm a believer in it begins and it ends at the top and i i just you know jeff is a wrestling guy you know the blood is in jeff's body sometimes he's a pain in the backside to get along with and as am i and as are you but at the end of the day bro we know what's good for business and I, I just think they'd be in a whole different place right now. Let me let me just tell you what I think about Jeff real quick on that. I think Jeff was there long enough to show results. And a lot of times he took advantage of his position and he held people back and he did not do what was right for business. And sometimes he just did what was right for him. But I also think the fact that he lost power and uh, humbled him. And I think he looks at business a lot differently now. What could have been and what should have I done different? And now that I get a chance, I'm going to do it different. I think him going to Mexico and seeing how cool I was with him, because I could have been a dick. And we've done great, great, great business with him. And Karen, Karen is an incredible, oh, incredible. incredible talent incredible. on her own. Yep, yep. And so I think, you know, he wants another chance, you know, and he wants to do it right this time. And there's something to be said for that. People do change. You know, let me ask you this, Conan, with, with, with the state of professional wrestling right now, and bro, let, let's face it, you know, w- w- you know, I'm still in the business through Pyro and Ballyhoo. So, right. bro, I depend on the wrestling business to make a living. So, right. of course, I want to promote it. I want it to thrive. But he- here's what my concern is. When I watched that WWE product, and, you know, a couple of weeks ago, the rating was down to like a 2.69, you know, a lot of times it just seems that it's going through the motion, and I really don't know how many people, you know, just care about it, to be honest with you, at this point in time, and that pains me. But, bro, with with that being where the main company is, the WWE, Do you think there's even the possibility of like an upstart? And I'm not talking about, uh, uh, what is it? El Ray, Right. Because that's a different animal, bro. That that's, they're not competing with the WWE. That's a different animal. I'm talking about a promotion like Jeff's trying to start up. 
with where the WWE is right now business-wise, do you think it's possible to start an American successful promotion in the United States at this time? Well, yeah, you know, I think, uh, you know, I've always said that if uh, if um, there was no WWE, TNA would still be number two. Boom. <laughs> <clears throat> but, um, yeah, of course there's room, but you just got to – we all know this. It's like a broken record, Vince. You have to bring something different. I believe from talking with Jeff – that what he wants to bring is is like maybe a a Japanese style, a quicker athletic style, you know, and uh, which is what we're doing. But we're doing with Lucha Libre, so I, um, uh, you know, I don't think anybody will ever compete with WWE because it takes so much money and so many people that really know what they're doing. Right. But um, but there is there is room for an alternative. Not every, you know, I mean McDonald's the king of the hill, but still Burger King and Wendy's and motherfucking you know uh, In and Out and Fat Burgers and whatever. You know what I'm saying? Smash Burger. There's room for everybody, bro. Everybody can make money. Hey, let me ask you this, bro. With everything you've accomplished in this business, you know, both in Mexico, bo here in the United States, everything we just went over. Right. What What is the one thing that you're most proud of? Mm. I don't know. I couldn't just say one thing because there are so many things, but I just think, uh, you know, I don't know. The one thing that keeps me proud and keeps me in this business, Vince, and you'll understand this as a creative guy, is thinking about something and watching it grow mm -hmm. and watching people enjoy it and getting that feedback and people remembering you for that. Like, Vince, I remember this gimmick that, you know, whatever, you know, that's, that's what's cool. Uh, um, you know, you're a villain right now. I think, uh, you know, history will be kinder to you. Um, and, you know, you're a cool dude, bro. Just I think a lot of people think you go out of your way to be too controversial. Maybe they don't like that. But, um, you know, I always say this, you know, because a lot of people, when you came on my podcast, oh, why, why didn't you tell Vince this? And why didn't you tell Vince that? Because really, we don't have no heat. I don't have nothing, you know, with you and me, we've always been friends. You've always been cool. You love the business. You're passionate. You know, um, you know, you tried to help out you know, the younger guys, you know, we, we saw your work in WWE, which was brilliant, you know, and, uh, but you know, you're vilified for whatever reason it is. I just want you to know brother that I'm your friend and, and I always will be. And I always have been, you know what I'm saying? And, and I appreciate that for you, Conan and bro, I tell you, and I say this all the time to everybody, you, you put yourself on the line to go to bat for me on many occasions, and that's something that I will never, ever forget as long as I live. The thing about you, bro, that I really like, you know, that I respect about you, and, and this is where I think you're, you're unique. You know, the fact, bro, that, you know, you're 50 years old now, okay? And, bro, you're still as relevant today as you were 30 years ago. You still think that you can, you can think 2014 at 50 years old. And bro, trust me, I'm 53 years old. That's not easy. The older and older you get, the easier it is to lose touch with what's going on. I, I think right now, bro, that's Vince McMahon's biggest problem. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, Vince doesn't know what's going on in the well, world around him. Of course, him. what, what 72 old billionaire could Exactly. But bro, honestly, Conan, what 50 year old could, and that's the cool thing about you. And you know, what proves that bro, what proves that is you've got this new show starting on October 28th. I got the feeling, bro, that the first time people see it, it's going to blow people away because just the presentation alone is going to be seen it. No, I haven't. I Brother, haven't. You should check it out right now. Go to uh, L Ray network. I, I will. I, I right. will check it out. But, it's incredible. But, but again, bro, the, the phenomenal thing about it is there's 50-year-old Conan 
behind this project who's been doing this for the last 30 years, bro. And I got to tell you, it's th th just being able to stay relevant. Bro, you could go on TNA next week. You could take Hernandez and you could take Homicide and LAX would be the biggest thing on the show tomorrow. Bro, I don't know of too many people that can do that. I, I can't. I honestly know that I, I there are things I can't do now that I did back then. Bro, you you it, it's almost like you're timeless, bro. I'm starting to think that maybe it is the pot. <laughs> it's oh, got to be so bro, what it, is it? It's as you would call it the ganji. Bro, it is an the ganji. answer my question. What is it, bro? What is it? You you you're you're, you're you're timeless, bro. I don't know. I just think I don't I just like to fucking you know, know what's going on and, you know, and, and just be relevant in what I'm doing, you know, and I know I'm going to be an on-screen character for a couple more years. So I just try to stay relevant. And that's it. Now, Conan, listen, what, what, t tell everybody where they can follow you. Tell them about your podcast, your Twitter and all that. So, you know, tell them about when the show's going to start, the network it's on. Give us all that information. Okay. Let me, Make sure I got it here. Okay. Um, my podcast is MLW.com. They have a whole bunch of other people on there. Uh, Ed, Eddie, Ed Teddy Bear Ferrara. Um, he's on there. Glenn Gilbernetti always stops by. He's one of our rotating guests, which I'm pretty sure he'll be one of Vince's rotating guests. Um, and uh, we also have on there Jim Cornette, um, uh, a personal favorite of Vince's. And uh, we have um, uh, Kurt Bauer. Um, and um, so anyways, and MSL. And uh, so anyways, you can go on there and check us out. You know, we talk about sports, politics, about gossip, wrestling, everything. Um, Vinny Rue's been on there before. Yep. And um, he enjoyed himself. Okay, so that's that. And then my Twitter is K-O-N as in numbers. N as in numbers, so K O double N A N, Conan 5150. And that's my Twitter. And I will be following you, Vince. And tell us about the show now, bro. October 29th, you said? October 29th on El Rey Network. Uh, you know, if it, it isn't on your carrier or whatever the fuck it is that you watch TV on nowadays, to find out from your local carrier you know, when they're going to have El Rey. Now, we're going to physically see you on that show? Definitely. I have a lot of I have a lot of acting scenes. What what other faces this will October. we know on that show? Is, is Hoovy gonna make a guest Rain appearance Network on this show? Be on the show. Hoovy has been uh Hoovy has been uh, you might like this. Hoovy has been hired. Have you ever seen the uh, executives Vince when they rub that um tension ball on their fingers to release yeah, tension? Yeah, yeah, shit? yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, uh what Hoovy does is he puts some baby oil on your nutsack and then he <laughs> rotates your nuts in between his fingers to relieve your tension. That's what we're going to hire him for. Oh, uh, that who Does he have any more calendars laying around you think in the back? <laughs> that guy's too much, isn't he? Hey, look, so we're, we're, they're showing footage now of Lucha Underground. Look, I'm looking at it now as we speak. Tell me how sweet it is. I'm yeah. I'm really really looking forward to this. I mean, I I I I I have a good feeling about this. Wrestling's due, bro. Wrestling's due for something big. Which one did you just through. see? The 30-second one or the 3-minute one? The 30-second one. Tell whoever it is that sent you that to send you the 3-minute one. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be taking a look at it as soon as You know what, bro? I'm going to be No, but I want you to look at it while we're talking. Go yeah, ahead. I'm going to write a little something up on it too on the website and maybe I'll I'll put that 3 minute video on. Yeah, he's showing everything right here that that you'll be able to go see online. But now, listen, you're in Colorado right now, right? I'm in Colorado, yeah. And you're still smoking the vape pen or the hookah? I got the I got here, look, here, you Yeah. yeah. But I'm going to go get the real stuff this weekend. And you're going to smoke it on my show. I want to do it on your show so you can kind of walk me through it. All right. That would be awesome. That'll work for you? Of course. All right. And, well, it, and, and it will work for you. You won't be so high strung. Yeah, I, I need that. Listen, bro, you know I love you. You know I'll, I'll always love you. Can, can I tell you something real quick about your sons? Yes. Okay. Do you remember when they went to TNA? Yes. How old would you say they were then when oh I was my fucking gosh, around with them bro. back then? Uh, let's see. Six, 
10, uh, bro, probably about 12, 12 and 16. Come on, really? Younger, maybe? And I think older. Well, let's see, 2000, about 10 years ago, uh, uh, 16 and 18. Okay, 16 and 18, all yeah. right. Yeah. I would like to tell you that I was a, uh, a co conspirator in smoking some, as you would say, ganji with your sons. <laughs> you, at were that smoking, age. <laughs> you were smoking a ganji with the, you were smoking with a the, ganji with the, real, with the Russo boys. Bro, do you remember that night? Bro, remember we went to some little bar or something? We, we were playing that card game like all night. Yeah. Bro, do you remember that night on two occasions, my son VJ, and one time I was walking right next to Dixie Carter. Bro, remember he panted me twice? Yes. And yes. bro, I had no drawers on. I yes. had no <laughs> underwear, bro. Two times he did it. Not once, but twice. I was walking right next to Dixie Carter. That bro, was those awesome. were, were those the good old days or what? Those were great days. Those were well, great days. Well, Cody, listen, I thank you for coming clean about the ganja with the sons. I'm going to go back and punish them now. They're ne never too old to punish. And That's listen, awesome. bro, I, I, I love you for being a friend for all these years, and I'll never forget everything you did for me, bro. Oh, definitely. And please uh, let me know when you get the ganja so you can come on and smoke it on my show. I definitely will. I definitely will. And Conan, thanks again for everything. And bro, good luck with this show. I wish you all the luck in the world. Thank you very much, Vince. Nothing but love for you and respect. All right, you too, bro. Take care, my friend. All right, man. Cool. Bye. Peace. This is the best of Vince Russo's The Brand. To get these programs in their entirety, audio and video, visit us at VinceRussoBrand.com for more information.